Morning, everybody. Morning. We're getting started just a couple minutes early. The yeah, singing group's going to be here a little early to get set up. So we'll try to get things here wrapped up by 10 30 at least. So y'all might listen to me a little bit. Yay! There'll be a bunch of amens. We're still in Jonah. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 3. If you want to turn there. Jonah chapter 3. We'll probably still have some come in late. Or not late. But... Late. Yeah, late. <laughs> late. Jonah chapter 3. I'm going to blast it that way. And this morning we're going to be uh, talking about something really, really hard for us as Christians <clears throat> and as people. Uh, we've been going through Jonah, and I appreciate Brother James filling in last week. Uh, I'm sure he done a great job. Uh, we had a good time uh, with uh, CJ and Kaylin last weekend. Uh, last Sunday, got to uh, uh, take Tammy's mom to church and her aunt, her mom's boyfriend. Y'all be in prayer for them. Uh, her mom's boyfriend's an atheist. Uh, but he went to church with us. And uh, so y'all y'all pray for them. Uh, had a good service. The altar was full, so... They, they heard the gospel. So, that, that was our goal, was to uh, get family in church. Uh, so, okay. Uh, again, this is a, there's a, a famous passage in the Bible that says, uh, God doesn't look on the uh, outward appearance of man, but He looks on the inside of the heart. Uh, if we as Christians can learn to do that, I think things would be a whole lot better than what they are. Uh, but this morning we're going to be looking at uh, loving the ones you hate. Loving the ones you hate. And there are uh, some people in our lives that we just don't like. <coughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. It's just some folk in our life that have done things to us have said things about us, have have done certain things in, 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 uh, not even to us, but maybe to family or to friends or something, and we just don't like them. And if you say there's no anybody like that in your life, well, you're a woman liar, folks. Let me pray for you anyway. Because everybody's got somebody they just don't like. Uh, that, that's just normal. And uh, some people have problems with... Uh, and, and, and we'll go through some of this, but I want to look at a, a little bit of a, a, a few things. Uh, but we also kind of put ourselves in a, a, a frame of mind of uh, we're up here and they're down there as Christians. We try to put ourselves on a pedestal. Let me read uh, just a second. I, I thought this was interesting. I can't say it as eloquently as he can. So I'm just going to read what he said. It said a strange paradox sometimes exists with religious people. Religious groups have a code or a standard through which they view the world. And normally that code contains high moral standards, kind of like love, kindness, justice, and acceptance. That's, that's our code as, as Christians. Our, even any religious group pretty much. Uh, we, we, we talk about we've got to show kindness, we've got to have love, we've got to have uh, these things. One would expect that because of the moral base of their code, that all religious groups would extend love, kindness, justice, and acceptance to all people. But here's the paradox. Most religious groups struggle to do that. Why? Because the same high standards which binds the members of the group together tend to exclude those outside there. If you uh, think about ranchers back in the 1800s when they would first started putting up fences, uh, you remember there was a lot of conflict, a lot of stuff. Anybody watched watch the old westerns, you know how they used to battle about the fences, people put up fences. And uh, the, the thing about fences most ranchers will tell you it's not only to keep the animals in, but it's to keep other things out. 
And, and I think we as Christians build fences. What did they say? Good fences make good neighbors? That old saying used to be said a lot. And so we put up these fences around us and, and it's good to keep us inside and keep them outside. And so we, we have two different sets of people. And we can discriminate based on... Uh, I, I've been in churches where uh, if you didn't have the finest clothes, the nicest clothes, the, the hundred, two, three, four hundred dollar suits, five hundred dollar suits, the nice dresses, and didn't drive the nice cars, you pretty much weren't accepted there because your ties wouldn't make much of a difference anyway. I've been in churches where uh, race played a big part. I've been in churches where uh, nationalities played a big part. I've been in churches where denominations played a big part. Y'all remember we talked about the, the Burlington Revival here that was going on a while back. Uh, I don't know how many of you follow that stuff, but um, there was a, a, a preacher, his name's David Cloud, who was real popular amongst the, the independent Baptists, from what I understand. Uh, they got a whole lot of use for him. I guess he would fall into one of these categories of people I don't like. Uh, and just confession good for the soul. Uh, but you're you, you're gonna have a problem and and, and totally destroy and, and put down a revival because we had an assembly of God pastor open in prayer. Uh, that's just we need to get ourselves outside that fence. We need to quit worrying about the what the people outside have done, what they are, who they are, what they look like, where they come from. That was Jonah's problem. Um, the uh, Jewish people hated the Assyrians. And to be honest with you, they were really scared of the Assyrians. Uh, during Jeroboam the second's uh, reign, the Assyrians were becoming great into power. The Jews were scared they were going to come in and take over a little, little group of people and, and, and rule over them. They were scared and they did not like the Assyrians. The Assyrian capital was Nineveh. And we're going to look at a little bit of that. Uh, oh, I got up here. Let's read Jonah 3, 2 and 3, and then we'll get into it. 3, verse 2 says, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose, went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. That's all we're going to read right now. We'll look at some other stuff here in a minute. But the first thing I want us to look at is Nineveh, a great city. And I put this up here. Uh, now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Uh, I, get this thing to work. There it is. I put a, uh, some of these pictures up here. I thought you might enjoy this. This was the actual ruins of Nineveh. Some of the pictures of the uh, excavations of this city. This is a real city. This place exists. That's the reason why I like to put some of these pictures up here. I want you to understand this ain't a fairy tale. This ain't just something that was written about. Now, uh, one of the, the neat things about Nineveh, uh, prior to the late 1800s, most scholars laughed about what the Bible says about this place. Uh, because it says it was a three days journey. They have excavated and they have found, uh, in fact, let me, let me kind of go to this. Now let me go back. I don't want to manage. This thing ain't working. It was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent. That means it took three days, three days to walk from one side to the other side. Common terms tell us that we can walk 20 miles in a day, which would make the city 60 miles in circumference. Um, I tried to write down some of this stuff here. Uh, the immediate central part of the city was one mile by two and a half miles. And that's why your scholar said, well, it must be wrong. Because that, you could walk through that in a day. That wouldn't be a big thing. 
Uh, but the entire metropolitan area was over 60 miles in circumference. 60 mile long wall. There was a wall around this thing, 60 miles long. 100 feet tall. How tall the walls were. And the city had 1,500 towers that were 200 feet tall. Now, you, you think about our city today, that was, that was a, a, a place out there to go see. Uh, uh, it was an exceeding great city. Nineveh was uh, what we would consider Charlotte for this area. It, it was it was the metropolis, big huge city. Now I don't know about y'all. I don't like going to Charlotte. Amen. I don't like going to Charlotte even a little bit. There is nothing in Charlotte that I would want to go see. Now I might have to go see some stuff. I might have to go do some stuff. Have good doctors or whatever. I ain't going to Charlotte unless I have to go to Charlotte. And so, uh, this is the city that God has told Jonah, I want you to go to. So, it, it was great in size. Also, uh, not like this. Uh, it was great in souls. The Bible says this over in uh, Jonah 4.11. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, Wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Now, this is one of those things that uh, I believe it helps to study outside uh, culture, what uh, history tells us about cultures and things of that nature. Uh, I, I've heard this spoken of here. This, this this little common term here. Is used numerous times in the Bible. Uh, those that can't discern their right hand from their left hand. And we always just say that's people that's dumb. They can't figure out what's going on. or They, they, they don't have no morals or whatever. But this is a euphemism, a euphemism that was used in Old Testament literature to describe children. These were people, it's, and basically what it's telling us is there was 120,000 kids in this city. They couldn't tell their left hand. They didn't know no difference. They didn't know no way. So historians believe, and most of the scholars that I, I looked at and read through some of this stuff, believe that there were at least 600,000 people in this city. That's a lot of people in those days. That's a lot of people in these days. So this again, I don't like to be around crowds. Uh, everybody I tell you, I, I, I get in amongst a whole bunch of people. I, 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 I don't like that. Uh, this is a good crowd. I like this. this is, I, I like to see our church full of people. Uh, I just, and, and again, this is the group of people that God told Jonah to go see. 600,000 people that he don't like. One of these days, this thing will start working right again. I got you. Good thing. Good thing. Not only was it great in size, great in souls, but it was great in sin. <clears throat> These people weren't just like Charlotte. And when we think of Charlotte, we think of a lot of simple things going on, a lot of bad things happening in Charlotte. If you're going to compare this is something. The closest thing that I can possibly think of would be the Holocaust of World War II. When you start studying who the Assyrians were and what the Assyrians did, um, I, we talked about this a few, maybe a month or two ago. Uh, how many heard of Dracula? Y'all you know who Dracula is? The vampire. You know what I'm talking about? He is based on a true person. His name is Blod the Impeller. Uh, true person, real life person. Uh, and how he got such a reputation was his viciousness in war and in battle. And how he would take people and he would impel them on spiked poles around his kingdom so that he would ward people off. This was the same technique that the Assyrians used. They would skin people alive. I, I wrote some of this down and say, 
they would gouge out eyes, uh, pulled out tongues, skinned their captives of life, mutilated entire cities. What they'd do is they'd put these, these sharp things on their wheels of their chariots and they would ride through cities and villages and just destroy people. And they did it to put fear in people. They, they, they did it so that these guys over here go, uh-uh, I ain't messing with him folks. There's some crazy folk up in there. And these are the people <coughs> that God said, I want you to go preach to. And if He had said, I want you to go tell them that I am going to bless them mightily. I think Jonah would be like, well, yeah, Lord, I believe I'd do that. But he said, no, you're going to go tell them I'm going to bring judgment. So I'm going to tell somebody that's, that's known for their, their viciousness that God's fixing to bring judgment. Jonah really did not want to go to Nineveh. And he had many reasons why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. What are our reasons to not go to Nineveh? What are our reasons and what are our fears and what are our problems? And we can't go witness to our neighbor. We can't go witness to the people of the street. And we can't associate with people because of their their bank accounts, or because of their race, or because of their nationality, or because of their denomination. <coughs> what what is it that we're scared of? Loving the ones that we hate. And then, the last thing in the world Jonah wanted to do was to go to be the messenger of hope and faith to these people. These people were killing folk, torturing folk, vicious people. Why would I go? Why would I want to go tell you a message of hope? There, there are people that I know. And I can say this with, with conviction because I fail every day. <clears throat> there are people out there I don't go witness to because I don't like them for one reason or another. There's people out there that I don't think deserve to be saved. <clears throat> just to be honest. And they do. I'm just saying in my own carnal heart, so what instead of seeing the Ninevites revival as a victory for God, John saw it, Jonah saw it as a defeat for self righteousness. There's just some people I ain't gonna witness to. They ain't gonna get saved no way. I've seen some of the vilest people be saved. I remember we were talking about the, the revival. I remember the last night we were there. Uh, I think I shared with you about the guy. Uh, got up and, and, and spoke. <coughs> and, and they said that you can ask anybody from that area up there. They would tell you that this man was the meanest man in that area. He was a drunk. He was a fighter. He was just a vicious guy. Just real rough, mean person. And got saved in that meeting. God can save anybody. Amen. Amen. But how can they be saved if we don't preach to them? I, I keep thinking about how much we, we hate these politicians and all this stuff. Well, we'll pray for them. Let's, let's don't pray that Donald Trump or, or Hillary Clinton make good decisions. Let's pray that they're saved. Yeah, yeah. Let's pray for that. Yeah. Let God work out the details. Yeah. Let's pray for these people for salvation. Yeah. Instead of condemning and criticizing and putting them down, let's pray for, for God to convict their souls. Yeah. So here was Jonah's problem. Jonah made five major mistakes that caused him to be blind to the spiritual needs of the Ninevites and the victory <coughs> represented by the repentance. And here's where he messed up. <coughs> they were First of all, he looked at them 
nationally and not individually. God, you send me to Iraq or Iran or one of them places, I'm going to have a real problem. Or Syria. And that's an extreme. If God told you to go right in the heart of ISIS, which is basically what He told Jonah to do, if God told you to go right in the heart of ISIS or Al Qaeda, the people that you know are trying to kill Christians and wanted you to preach to them, wouldn't we be a little bit, oh man, God, I need to see a little idea on this one. <laughs> you stretch it out there a little bit now. But we do that to people here. And I'm going to get on a, a, a touchy subject. We don't, we don't want to go talk to the Mexicans because we don't like Mexicans. I hear that all day at work. <coughs> guys in there talk about Mexicans need to go back to Mexico. Blah, 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 blah. Or if they're Asians or if they're uh, Arabs or whatever. Give all these crazy names to them. I'm like, why not preach to them? Amen. Why not share the gospel to them? And that's what Jonah did. Jonah wasn't looking at the heart of the people. He wasn't looking at the people individually. He was looking at them as a group. Here's the Assyrians. Here's the bad people. This is the folks from Charlotte. We don't like folk from Charlotte. Or we don't like folk from the north. That's a good one for us. We don't like Yankees. Y'all don't talk like this. So we, we group people in what they call stereotyping. And we stereotype people. And, and we will refuse to witness to somebody just because they're different from us. He judged them historically and not prophetically. You say, what's that got to do with it? <laughs> These people had a really, really, really bad reputation. And Jonah judged them by what they were known for and what they had done in their past instead of looking at what they could do in the future. And we as I've heard this said ever since I was a kid, Baptists are the worst ones that kick you when you down. We say, oh, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me, but we refuse to forgive other people. I know what he done 25 years ago. wasn't that. What can he do now? I got a friend I've shared with y'all before. His name's Sam. He makes two of them. Big boy. Big fella. One of the Roughest biker guys you'd ever meet. <coughs> mean, mean fella. Went home, visited his grandmother. She begged him to go to revival. He went just because it was his grandmother. Got saved in the revival. Now he preaches all over the place. He's got a long ponytail down here. Wears leather jackets. Got tattoos all over his arms. And he said, I wanted to cut my hair and start wearing suits and stuff like that. He said, but he said, listen, God told me that where what where he wanted me. God wanted to use me somewhere else. And so he deals with biker gangs. He's in, that's his mission field. His biker gangs. And he he go in and talk to these biker guys and he'll talk to them and witness to them. He's got a whole group of guys that travel with him that used to be rough, tough, drug, drinking biker dudes. But somebody, some grandma had enough to not give up on him. Pray for him. And if we looked at his past and looked at what all he had done, what all he had been through, and how he had lived, we would be like, man, this is how. He don't deserve to be saved. And Jonah looked at the Assyrians and said, Listen, for what all you've done, you don't deserve to be saved. He looked at them. Oh, I, I, yeah, I didn't put this verse up here because I like this. 
2 Corinthians 5.17. If you look at the Old Testament, you can New Testament first. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new. Y'all know what that word new means? New in time, new in nature. Everything's changed about it. So these, these people that we have think are so bad because of their past, because of the things that they've done, the things they've lived through. The Bible says that God makes them new. So whether you look at them one way, God looks at them different. So instead of criticizing and running down, man, let's, let's lift them up and let's, let's tell them about Jesus. Now I ain't telling you to go up here and go in the middle of the alcohol and biker game and start trying to preach to them. That might be a little dangerous. But if God tells you to, you better listen. <laughs> he looked at them fiercely, not spiritually. Another one of those things, He looked at them as a, another nationality, another group of people. And, and these, these two kind of run together, I, I feel like, um, physically and ethnically. And we talked about that. I think we are so bad to criticize people and to put that fence around us, put that barrier around us. There's only certain people that we'll witness to. There's only certain people that we'll talk to about the gospel. Only certain people that we'll even converse with. And they're rich, I'm not talking to them. If they're Pentecostal, I'm not talking to them. If they're black, I'm not talking to them. If they're Mexican, I'm not talking to them. If they're ugly, I'm not talking to them. If they're pretty, I'm not talking to them. If they live over on the other side of the road, I'm not talking to them. If their last name's Smith, I ain't talking to them. <laughs> we have every reason in the world. We come up with every barrier that we can come up with not to tell somebody about Jesus. Everything we can possibly think of. And so we narrow it down to this just one of the people that we feel like that's the only ones we need to talk to and we need to witness to. And, and God said, John, I'm taking you out of your comfort zone. I'm going to put you somewhere where you are the least comfortable. I think this is where this one comes in. He looked at them hatefully, not mercifully. We got people that, and I know that's a strong word, hate. We just say don't like. There are people that we don't like, so we don't do this. Now I'm going to take it a step further, and, and we've talked about this before. Brother Chad's a, a Methodist. And, and, and I don't agree with the, the Methodist teaching. I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with how they teach and what they preach. And I don't like the way they do the church services. And I don't like none of that stuff. Brother Houston over here is a lost soul. Brother Chad has been witnessing to Brother Houston. And I come up to Brother Houston and I start that man, listen, them Methodists are a bunch of idiots. They're, they're a bunch of crazy folk. They don't know what they're talking about. They got all their doctrines all mixed up. They even use the NIV sometimes. And I give you every reason in the world for him not trust him. And all I did was turn him away from the gospel. I didn't hurt him at all. So in my criticism, in my barriers, and in my fences, and in, in my putting everybody else away and, and, and trying to put everybody else down, I have hindered him being saved. I, I read that article uh, last week where the guy was putting out the, the Burlington Revival because uh, of some of the stuff that he was saying. Uh, the Assembly of God pastor opening in prayer uh, the, the, they actually sung in Christ alone. They sung that song. Satan must have been in that meeting. He literally said that. 
And I wonder how many people, how many people that have read his articles that were touched by that revival and, and, and maybe were that far from, from accepting Christ and conviction was on them and they read that article because this Christian man put down this Christian man. He didn't want nothing to do with it. Love blindly is the word we need to remember. Love blindly. I know that, that man over there don't act like I act. He don't dress like I dress. He don't talk like I talk. He don't think like I think. His entire culture is different than mine. But you know what? The same Jesus that saved me can save me. <laughs> I, there was a thing in here, I don't remember what was that in the book, but uh, I, I thought about it. I think about some of these uh, youth when they go on these mission trips to these foreign countries and, and they go to some of these places and uh, kids listen to the parents. Whether we believe it or not, kids listen to the parents. And if me and Tammy sit in our house and we run down this church or we run down this group of people or we run down this family or if we run down these people. Trust me, Tyler's going to do the same thing. He's going to have that in his mind and in his head. And if we talk about how stupid math is and math is ridiculous, I don't know why we have to study math. When he goes to school, that's the mentality he's going to have to go to school. Lesson. And so when we talk about other denominations, when we talk about other races, when we talk about other people, when we talk about other, uh, even religious groups, listen to me, Jehovah's Witnesses need to be saved. Muslims need to be saved. Buddhists need to be saved. It's not about what they believe, what they do, what they look like, where they come from. It's about we have a Savior that we need to share with. Amen. Amen. And so when these young people would go to some of these countries, and I've seen them go to Taiwan, I've seen them go to the Philippines, I've seen them go to some of these places, and they get down there and they've got these, some of them's got these mentalities in their mind <coughs> that these are uh, uh, trailer park trash. The best way I can describe it in, in our white language. Uh, just, just we, that's the way we talk about folks. And so when we go to the Philippines or we go to Taiwan, we go to these, these third world countries where people's living in cardboard boxes and in huts and these things, we get this, this mentality. That's what we tell and we talk about. So our kids, when they go down there, that's the mentality. Oh, well, these poor people, we're coming to help these poor people. And then they get down there and they're like, man, these people are just like us. They hurt just like I hurt. They laugh just like I laugh. They feel just like I feel. They got a family just like I got a family. And then they get down and they want to go back the next year, the next year, the next year. Because, man, they, they, they realize we really are part of the same group of people. And no matter where they're from or what language they speak or how they look or what they... Listen, it's about sharing the gospel with people. <coughs> and if you would get amongst some of those people that we don't like, you probably find they're not like you. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh because he hated those people. He hated the Assyrians. Was he scared? Yeah, he was scared. I would have been. If, if God come down with directive like that, go to somewhere to preach to ISIS or something, man, I would be scared out of my mind. But I just wondered what my motivation would be not to go. Would it be out of fear? Would it be because I don't like them? Or I don't believe they deserve to be saved. Old preacher back up the mountain used to say, we need to change our, our stinking thinking. Thinking. Let's look at people as opportunities. Let's look at people as an opportunity to come up and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. And you really, you really, and 
And you'll learn it. And I really preach or tell you this. You'll learn if you'll go some places and you'll talk to some people, you won't even have to bring up the subject. You just start carrying on a conversation talking about the sale at Walmart. And God will open that door. He'll open that door. You just got to know when to jump on. Uh, Y'all hear me talk about Dusty, the guy at work. His daddy's preacher. He has to talk Dallas. Uh, he came up to me this week and he told me, he said, man, he said, I missed a good one. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I run across a couple that, <laughs> anyway, long story short, he run across a couple that had got married in their church and he was talking to them and said, hey, is your dad so and so? He said, yeah, yeah, that's my dad. He said, oh, yeah, he married us. I'm like, cool. And uh, I said, well, yeah, I said, we we don't we'll go to church nowhere. He said, he left it at that. He just walked up. And, and he said, man, I, that was my open. He said, God opened that door wide open. He said, I, I was so busy to get my stuff and get out that I missed that up. He said, when I was driving down the road, he said, it hit me. He said, man, God opened that door wide open. And I just walked right off the Amen. That's what we got to look for. When we run across that, that Mexican store, we can't hardly understand him. Show kindness and love to them. Want to see it all change around for them. Love them. That's what God's called us to do, not judge them. Love them. Tell them about Jesus. That's what we need to do. <coughs> Jonah did go, and Jonah did teach. Next week, Put it up there. The beginning of a revival. Next week, revival broke out in Nineveh. I get tickled. I wish I could find the video. If I can find it, I might bring it. The guy went through the whole sermon, whole lesson, about 10 minutes long. He talked about how God had prepared him for this message. He was speaking like he was Jonah. He said, listen, he said, I went to study. He said, I got my concordance out. I got my commentaries out. He said, I got my dictionaries out. I got all my words eloquently prepared. Made sure I had everything right. He went through this whole big spiel. He said, I knew exactly how I was going to prepare my sermon and what I was going to say. And I got everything down to the letter. He said, I had it memorized. I practiced it in the mirror five or six times a day to make sure that when I got there, I said it exactly the way it needed to be said. He said, and when I walked out on that beach, he said, I preached my sermon. He said, I said, repent. It don't take a lot of words, y'all. It just takes a heart willing to love somebody that you hate. It takes a heart willing to love somebody that you don't understand. To say, I love you enough to tell you about Jesus. Let me, let me, let me rephrase that. I love Him enough to tell you about Him. I love Him enough. That I'm not going to worry about what you've done in your past. I'm not going to worry about where you came from. I'm not going to worry about who your family is. I'm not going to worry about what color you are. I'm not going to worry about how much money you have, what side of the tracks you live on. <coughs> I love Him enough that i got to tell you about it. <coughs> I'll never forget my pastor that I had years ago when I lived in Tennessee. He said he went to uh, Amsterdam. It was a, uh, a preacher's conference of some kind and uh, he had actually worked out through their association they sent a few pastors and he was one of the ones to call them and uh, I'll never forget him telling me he said Marty you just wouldn't believe what it was like to be in there with all these people from all these different nationalities and different cultures and different dress and, and the way they acted and the way they talked half of them you couldn't understand a lot of what they said you know he said but and he said, we all got in that big old room. He said, there were 6,000 people in there. He said, I don't know how many languages, how many nationalities, how many colors. I, I don't remember who all was in there. He said, but here's what we did. He said, we got up. We opened the book. They started playing the piano. He said, and we all sang 
victory in Jesus. And we sang it in our own language. He said, the glory of God. He said, I did not understand what that man was singing. He said, but I do. He said, I didn't understand what that man was singing, but I do. If we just take the blinders off. Look at people in love. Look at them through Christ's eyes, not ours. I think we'll see a change in how we treat people. I think we'll see a change in how we witness people. A person you don't like, maybe now's the time to witness them. And you ain't got to go up to them and say, I'll tell you what Jesus did. Go up to say, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. Be amazed what that'll do for folks. Next week, revival starts in Denver. And I hope you'll be here. Anybody got anything you want to add real quick before we go? Y'all remember the preacher? He's, he's heard the past. 